Coming up on the Civil Discourse, Classical Studies Professor and MacArthur Genius Award recipient, Dr. Emily Wilson, discusses her translation of Homer's The Odyssey. This translation demonstrates the ways in which each new interpretation forwards both the universality and the changing aspect of this great work. Gender is one of the many social categories that the poem is interested in. Um, and of course, the social category of do you die or not die, or are you enslaved or not enslaved? Hello and welcome to The Civil Discourse. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, speaking to you from the Leonard Pearlstein Gallery at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, my guest is Dr. Emily Wilson, Professor of Classical Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the author of five books, the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Award, and a recent translator of Homer's Odyssey from the Greek. Her translation follows by about 20 years the translation by Robert Fagels and demonstrates the way this great poem speaks to audiences differently over time, how each new translation forwards both the universality and the changing aspect of the work. Emily Wilson, welcome to The Civil Discourse. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to talk to you. Well, you are a classicist, and there was a time when classical languages and literature were at the center of the liberal arts education. This is no longer the case. Tell me what it is that drew you to so-called dead languages and texts. Um, I mean, I, I first got, I, like many people, I first got excited about Greek myths when I was a kid. I got to uh, my, my elementary school, which is just an ordinary public for free um, elementary school in Britain. Mm -hmm. They put on a production of the Odyssey for eight, for performed by eight-year-olds. And I got <laughs> to play the goddess Athena, so that was very exciting. Um, I was lucky that it was offered in my high school, because if it hadn't been, because I grew up in Britain, it wouldn't have been possible for me to study those languages and those literatures When did you start studying the languages? When I was 14. OK. Yeah. And that is, is that still common in? certain schools in Britain? There's a whole class element to, and the privilege element to the, um, the ways that certain people, certain demographic groups get access to studying those languages. Hmm. And in Britain and in the, in the US, there's a real push and movement to try and change that and try and open, open up the, the serious study of the ancient world to all kinds of different people. Because of course, antiquity doesn't belong to any of us. It's right, a very, very right. alien set of different cultures. That's so I think it's important you know, to try and get different voices within modernity to engage with all these very alien voices from the past. Well, I understand that, and especially for um, middle and high school but then I wonder, as a professor, mm -hmm. um, when you have students coming in to, who want to study or want to go on for graduate work in the classics, mm -hmm. how you, what you counsel them given, I guess, the job market in the humanities, yeah. and particularly views on classical literature in general. What's your attitude and what's their attitude as they come in through yeah. the, your program? I mean, the, the job market is terrible. You're right. I mean, it's, it's terrible in general for the humanities. It's terrible specifically for um, classical studies. Um, I mean, I, th I don't think it's 100% terrible. I think there's a lot of um, desire on the part of young people, including undergraduates, to learn about um, great books and also to learn about the past. And that there's an awareness that we don't know everything if we only know about what's happening right now. Maybe ways that studying... Um, very ancient cultures can illuminate. I mean, if we read the, the account of the plague and the Iliad, maybe that's going to help mm. us understand how do we respond to viruses today if we learn about yeah. how does the Odyssey represent colonialism or migration or communities or families. It, it helps us understand yeah. things. I think there's a lot of energy for trying to ask those questions and new perspectives on antiquity that's there. Um, and it's obviously difficult because I'm not in control of you know, which, which departments are going to get money? Or how yeah. can I enable students who don't necessarily come from a privileged or background who aren't necessarily white, how do I encourage those students to feel that it can belong to them? Right. So tell us about what it is that drove you to do this translation. Um, what motivated me, so when I was asked to consider doing it, I went and did the exercise of 
rereading book nine very, very slowly in Greek and then reading um, a dozen translations and thinking about my own experiences um, in the classroom of trying to uh, um, ask students to engage with this poem and the, thinking about what can these existing translations enable in that space of either the general reader's experience or the student's experience and what is not enabled by the existing translations. And then after doing that, I thought there is space for something which enables different things, enables different kinds of responses. Yeah. And the first set of things I thought about was poetic form. Um, because, of course, the dominant mode, not just for Homer, but for all um, Greco-Roman metrical texts, metrical poems, within um, English translations of the last 50 years, is to use either prose or stacked prose, free verse. Yeah. So even though the original has this very clear marked rhythm, meter, it's metrical all the way through, the Homeric poems are designed to be performed out loud, most translations that people read are not metrical. And... And you um, use iambic pentameter, iambic which pentameter. is the English meter. It's the English equivalent yeah. to dactylic right. hexameter. Dactylic hexameter within the world of archaic Greece signals mm -hmm. this is normal narrative verse. This is designed to be performed out loud. And I think the only way you can make that same signal so that the reader is, feels that invitation to read out loud, if she wants, wants to, is to use the, the native Anglophone meter of iambic pentameter. So I wanted to, um, that's very interesting that the, the use of meter was one of the things that drove you, but yeah. there's a conceptual element too that we'll get yeah. to. But um, I just thought I would read the first lines of three famous translations. Sure. And then have you read the first, sure. I guess, 11 lines of, sure. your, of yours. Um, so first, George Chapman from 1616. And of course, I only know this translation through the great Keats poem on first looking into Chapman's yes. Homer. And some people may know that poem, which is just a very extraordinary a poem. poem. Yes. Um, and it starts, the man, O muse, in form that many a way wound with his wisdom to his wished stay that wandered wondrous far when he the town of sacred Troy had sacked and shivered down. A lot of alliteration there. I love alliteration. I love the alliteration. <laughs> I do too. It's I mean, it's very, yes. But I mean, is there alliteration in there the... There is. I tried, I mean, I tried to be pretty alliterative myself, not, okay. not, in, not in exactly the same places. I think Chapman, in a way, is you know, pulling out all the... It has a rococo quality to it. I love it. Yes. And then Richard Lattimore, 1967, yeah. just two lines. Tell me, muse, of the man of many ways who was driven far journeys after he had sacked Troy's sacred citadel. Much more pedestrian sound. Right, and not, not rhythmical, no rhyme, no meter. Yes. Fagel's 1996. Mm -hmm. Sing to me of the man, muse, the man of twists and turns, driven time again off course once he had plundered the hallowed heights of Troy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm going to ask thing. you <laughs> to read your first stanza, if you sure. will. Not 2017, and 2017, I, I yes. should, should make clear. Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy, and where he went and who he met, the pain he suffered on the sea, and how he worked to save his life and bring his men back home. He failed, and for their own mistakes, they died. They ate the sun god's cattle, and the god kept them from home. Now, goddess, child of Zeus, tell the old story for our modern times. Find the beginning. You, first of all, your reading is very <laughs> wonderful. And, yeah, like you know, it's so, it's so dramatic in the use of monosyllabic mm -hmm. words. Yeah. Um, is that, how does that compare with the Greek? The Greek is much more polysyllabic than my translation is mm -hmm. because I, I mean, I actually think even beyond thinking about what's, what works for this language, um, one has to think about meter. Pentameter works in English in a way that hexameter works mm -hmm. in Greek. Um, I think also in order to get the, um, the read aloud ability in English, I felt that, that I wanted to use quite a lot of Anglo-Saxon as opposed to Latinate words, partly also to get away from the idea that um, epic uh, means something sub-Miltonic or Whitman-esque, um, which is obviously anachronistic because that's mm -hmm. not what epic means within the folk poetry tradition of archaic Greece. Mm. Um, so I wanted a discourse uh, to find to try and create a poetic style 
that would not be um, sort of constantly making the reader think of, I'm reading this in the wake of Pope or in the wake of what we think of as grandiloquence. It's, it's the yes. oral tradition. It's the oral tradition. Back they want it to be, in a way, sort of ballad, a ballad kind of lexicon, even if the meter isn't ballad meter. And I also, yeah. um, another key element that I felt was um, one of the things that, that made, motivated me was thinking about pacing and thinking about the way that. In the original, I think the Homeric poems have this um, tell me more quality, where you want, always want the singer to keep going, the story has all these cliffhangers, you don't have time to get bored. Whereas in translation, there's always this tendency to expand on the original. Because yeah, of course, yeah. you know, I mean, you read the Fagel's translation, tell me about the man, the man, let me repeat a word which is not repeated in the original, because yeah. that's the only way I can get it into English. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep it, so I kept it to the same number yeah. of lines as the original, to force myself to be always thinking about pacing. Tell us about Homer. Tell us about that complexity of the authorship of this poem. It's very complex because I mean, no, nobody knows even was there a single person that we can call Homer. I mean, even in antiquity, uh, the identity of whoever, either singular or plural, created the Iliad and the Odyssey, who really knows? Um, yeah. So the, the Odyssey and the Iliad are both based on a long oral tradition and created during the many centuries in which um, the Greek-speaking world had no reading or writing whatsoever. So the, all the stories about Troy, the destruction of this great city, and then the problematic homecoming journeys of the great um, Greek-speaking heroes from Troy back to all the different locations and different parts of the Greek-speaking world, those legends about Agamemnon and, and Theseus and Jason and Odysseus, and um, those all grew during those centuries. And also during those centuries, there grew this poetic storytelling style, mm. um, which drew on multiple different dialects, which grew on words, um, both from the beginning of that tradition to the, to the end of that tradition, which included all these formulaic phrases. Mm. And then um, there was this tradition of oral poets composing, but then composing not entirely from scratch because they had these pieces that they could plug in and these sort of preset narratives that they could then tell in some variant way. Um, the Iliad and the Odyssey um, both emerge from the period when Greece became literate. So probably fairly soon after the Greek-speaking world um, developed the alphabet, developed the Greek alphabet, these poems were produced. And the exact mechanism by which that, how, how exactly did that happen? How exactly did the Odyssey, which is much too long to have been performed all at once after dinner, mm. um, how did this monumental response to the oral tradition get um, converted into this long written text? Was that one person? Was it more than one person? Was it a, an oral poet who was a genius and what? And, and you keep that in literate? flux for yourself in terms I, of I thinking I keep that about in flux. I mean, there are <laughs> scholars who think there was, was a definitive answer. I mean, there were different theories about exactly when did these poems get committed to writing, exactly what was the process. I mean, I feel that without a time machine, we can't actually definitively answer what's known as the capital H, capital Q, Homeric question. Um, we can, what we can do is look at other oral traditions around the world. I mean, of course, that before the internet, before texting, before smartphones, mm -hmm. there were a lot of um, traditions with oral tradition, cultures with oral traditions. Yeah. Um, we have, it's, you know, modern hip hop is in a way an oral tradition. Um, so we can learn something about how do people compose poetry out loud. But then I think one of the big, big takeaways from doing that comparative analysis is it's very different in different cultures. And yeah. there isn't actually a single model. But that is an model. interesting comparison, which I'm sure you make in the classroom, yeah. between contemporary oral poetry and music and so forth, and um, mm -hmm. this ancient right. kind. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the sure. protagonist. Um, you know many contradictions and ambi ambiguities in the mm -hmm. representation of this character. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us what you think of him? Both sort of personally, I, I feel for the way that, that it, I think at the heart of Odysseus's character, as he's depicted in the Odyssey, is this, um, this tension between wanting to, to do self-revelation and here's me and here's my status and I'm going to dominate everybody and I'm the best and mm -hmm. I'm the smartest. But then there's also, I'm nobody and I could be anybody and I'm going to pretend to be somebody else all the time. And of course, being a translator, in a way that's that's what I'm doing all the time. I'm constantly voicing words which are both my words and they're somebody else's words. And yes. I came what, from well, how do your students respond? I mean, especially over time, uh, 
because I've noticed in teaching certain yeah. texts that students will respond one way 10 years ago, yeah. and you've been 17 years teaching these texts. Years, yes. um, do you notice a change uh, in the last few years with respect to this character in particular, and maybe Penelope as well, his wife, who's waiting yeah. at home for him to return? Yes. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I think throughout the, in fact, because I was started teaching as a graduate student, I think throughout the last 20 years, I've noticed this. There's definitely a tendency among students to be very hostile to Odysseus. And I don't think that's, I mean, I don't think any response is wrong. I don't think that's a wrong response. I think yeah. there's a way that you can nudge, I, mean, I, I try to nudge students to bit, tease yeah. and nuance and complicate <laughs> that and to ask about is the student is the student being judgmental in, in ways that overlap with how the text is being judgmental, or is there a gap between the particular moralizing judgments that the student may have about Odysseus's philandering, which may not be quite what's at stake for the narrator. Uh -huh. It might be that there's a different um, set of attitudes about what marriage is supposed to be that right. might be imported by the contemporary, perhaps uh, Christian background student that might not be the same as what's at stake in what marriage is. So do you in think it's poem? interesting to think about whether it in fact is this critique is embedded in the poem or yeah. whether it's being superimposed and you want mm -hmm. the student to be aware of that yes. disjunction? Yes, I, yeah. and I want the student to be aware of what she's bringing or, she, or he's bringing and I also want the student to be aware of um, where, where is that in the poem or where is that not in the poem? I think, that, I think it's not the case that there's no critique of Odysseus. I'm just mm -hmm. not sure that it's all about adultery. I don't think adultery matters very much yeah, at all. Yeah, that's not that's a central not, that's point. That's not all that important. There are other um, elements. Are what other do you, elements what do you think is being critiqued about Odysseus? I think what, part of what's being questioned is, um, is more to do with privilege and to do with, I mean, I, I read the beginning um, of the poem. It seems to me that in the, in the poem, um, there's so much focus on one person gets a nostos, one person gets a journey home. Nobody else gets a journey home. All those other men are dead, and they're dead because of him. They're dead mm. because they left with him. Some and of them were killed leader, on the battlefield. And he's he the leader, and, yeah. the, and nobody else gets a journey home. And then every other experience of, of home is different from that of Odysseus. So I think there's a real awareness both of cultural difference and of um, what is it like to be homeless? What is it like not to reach your home? Well, how, is, how is the experience of being at home different if you're female or different if you're enslaved? Um, or different if you're a goddess or a god and you get to live forever and you get to shape your own home space in a way that no, um, no mortal person can fully do. Um, so I think that's definitely at stake in the poem. Um, and I, and I think that's actually a really interesting question, an interesting yeah. set of questions that are there. Well, what, in, what um, constitutes a protagonist or a hero within that culture, right? Mm -hmm. And that's part of right. the question. Right, but I also, yeah. I mean, I guess one of my big um, things that I want to bring out in the classroom that I also wanted to bring out in the, in the translation was that the Odyssey isn't just Odysseus's story. I mean, mm. it's called the Odyssey because that's the traditional title. But um, again, as, as is already clear in those first 11 lines, it's the story of many, many different people and their experiences of community and home. And it's about how this single journey affects all those other journeys. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, it is a very violent mm -hmm. um, poem. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and sexist in, in certain ways that mm -hmm. at least from our vantage point, we look at it and we mm -hmm. cringe a little bit. Um, how is it as a woman translating mm -hmm. in the 21st century, teach mm -hmm. a teacher and a yeah. mother, um, you brought that to bear in your translation? Yeah. I think those are two separate questions. I mean, I think women can be violent. Women can serve in combat. Um, I kind of love the violence. I, lo I, okay. I love. I mean, I, I love. Yeah. I, I chose book nine partly because I was. Um, but do you think women see violence in a different way from men? Not this? necessarily. Not a, okay. No, I mean, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. It depends on the person, doesn't it? I, okay. I well, then, even yeah. asking you as a woman yeah. translator perhaps is a yeah. not a very good question for you. I just think it's really important not to be predetermined about gender. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at translations of the Odyssey. Um, by women into other languages. I really don't think you see, I think if you had to pick out of a lineup, here, here's all the Italian translations, all the French translations, all the English translations, pick mm -hmm. the ones that are by women. There's no way you could do it. And it's I mean, funny that you're touted, yeah. I think, as the first woman to yeah. have translated, which is not true. 
Right, yeah. that shows the sort of narrowness of we're only going to pay attention to what happens in English. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't exist if it's in, in the rest of the world, which I think is really problematic. Um, so I mean, maybe we should get back to the question of does gender matter in this poem? I think it matters a lot. Mm -hmm. I think gender is one of the many social categories that the poem is interested in. Um, and of course, the social category of do you die or not die? Or are you enslaved or not enslaved? And do you have a home? I do you not have a home? Are you Greek speaking or not Greek speaking? Are you culturally othered? in whatever ways those might be. I think all of those are extremely important in the poem, and I certainly wanted to be very conscious about how do I approach those questions? How do I, how do I be, how can I be critical about it? How can I be thoughtful about it? How can I be aware that my particular assumptions about social difference might or might not map onto the assumptions that the poem is making and think about those things? Mm -hmm. I mean, so it seems to me that um, approaching the poem with questions about social difference very consciously in mind, that makes a difference. And one section of that is thinking about gender difference. But that's only a section of all of this whole set of questions about social difference. So let's talk about the passage that is so striking um, at the end, near the end, when um, Telemachus, the, who's a young, as you make a point of saying, is a very young man, and is given the task by his father of killing the women mm -hmm. who have consorted with the suitors who have taken over the house of Odysseus, mm -hmm. trying to court Penelope. Mm -hmm. um, and he is told by his father to, to hack them to death mm -hmm. um, and chooses to hang them. Mm -hmm. And the passage, and I just, I'll read the passage sure. since I have it written here and then maybe you could talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, first, these girls are made to carry out the suitors' dead bodies, clean the house, and then they're hung. Mm -hmm. um, the girls, their heads all in a row, were strung up with the noose around their necks to make their death in agony. They gasped, feet twitching for a while, but not for long. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that translation of this, which is mm -hmm. so simple and powerful mm -hmm. and, and poignant and disturbing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I, I certainly read it, I read that whole sequence of Telemachus um, murdering the enslaved people as very, very disturbing in the original, and disturbing partly because of the, I think it's very characteristic of the Homeric poems, the, the clarity and simplicity with which the poem manages to get you to somewhere very, very deep by showing you both um, the perspective of Telemachus himself. You fully understand why is he doing this. He's this bullied young man who has a tendency to assert himself by shutting women up, and you know, no wonder he wants to put the noose around their necks. Um, you can see why Odysseus wants to assert full ownership over the household and why Telemachus feels that his honor is compromised by the existence of human beings who have memories of the previous owners. Mm. That in order to erase the suitors, they need to erase the 13 people, one man and 12 women, who've been claimed by the quote-unquote wrong slave owners. Um, I, and but then we also see the perspective of the women themselves. I mean, so the, it, just before the lines you quoted, there's a simile that compares the women to um, doves or thrushes that are trying to fly back to their mm. homes, to their nests. So in a way, it's, it's showing how they want a nostos, they want a homecoming, and they don't get it, just like the, the men. They don't have, have a homecoming. So I wanted to bring out the simplicity of it, and also in those last lines, the way that they're not being presented as choosing their deaths. So there's, a, in, there's involuntary twitching. Yeah. Oh. Where I've looked at other, other translations, and it's striking to me how both there's, an, there's very often an importing of extra language to try and make Telemachus be um, exacting a just punishment, which isn't at all how I read the Greek, but that's how people, people want to try and um, tone down the violence and horror by making it seem like this is okay, they're dehumanized. They use sluts or whores for yes, the translation on these women. Which dehumanizes or criminalizes in a yeah. way that the Greek doesn't do. It, does, it doesn't present them as... On the other yes. hand, you make a point in your introduction that your translation is not a literal one, not to say that there's ever a literal translation. Right, there isn't such a but, thing. Yeah. But a, a translation theory, as it has evolved in the current climate, yeah. is very much about the creative process of translation. I wonder if you could just say a few words as we yeah. move toward the end of this yeah. interview about your view of translation as yes. it exists in the current uh, culture. Yes, I mean, I think that the way translation is perceived in the current culture, uh, you're absolutely right. It includes this very simplistic binary between um, the literal, faithful, accurate, truthful translation and the poetic, pretty one, which is going to be all lies. And of course, in fact, a literary text has all kinds of things that are true about it. So for instance, it's true that 
the Homeric poems are composed in this beautiful metrical rhythmical sound. Um, it, we have this idea that missing all of that out is telling the truth. Why is that the truth? We, the question really is, which truth do you want to tell? Right. I want to tell the truth. I want to tell. A, I, mean, I want to be as responsible as I can possibly be, and I want to also be constantly thinking about which truths do matter most. Because I can't tell all the truths in this in a single book, however long it is. I can tell as many truths as I possibly can in order to make them come across to the reader. I, I understand that. So we're nearing the end here, and I just wonder what your next project is. Are you translating the Iliad? I sure am. You yes. are? Yes. Oh. Yes. Sure um, and yes. when will we have that available to us? It's going to be at least four years. Oh. Yes. So you start, anyway, well, it's, a it's a five-year project. This project. This was five yes. years in yes. the making. Yes. And do you enjoy the process? Is I it love fun? it. It's so yeah. fun, yes. I mean, I, it, the Iliad is very different. And is it? It's very yeah. different partly because there are so many more names, and the names really matter because, of course, it's a poem that's about about whether it's worth dying for your name and how do people form networks through the people whose names they're connected to. Um, so it is te technically it's very different to try and be constantly grappling with the language of outrage and anger and insult, which is really fun to do as well. Yeah. How do you cuss somebody out? For someone who likes within, violence, within yes. Violence. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of violence. Yeah. Yes, it's great. And, <laughs> I am, we are looking forward to yes. it. I'll wait four years. We'll go by quickly, yes. I'm sure. <laughs> and I want to thank you so much. Thank this you has been so an much. illuminating interview. Thank you so much. Yeah. And okay. thank you for joining us today for The Civil Discourse. Mm -hmm.